<clears throat> okay, welcome everyone to the second installment of an ongoing conversation on municipalism. Um, uh, it's This is the product of the Solidarity Research Center. And fittingly for May 1st, today we're going to focus on labor and municipalism and the role of municipalist ideas in the labor movement. Um, do you want me to continue or is there an interpretation? Okay. Um, so uh, as you know, for centuries, working class communities have struggled to exercise their rights in the civic sphere as well as control over their labor conditions, often in tandem with other social movements. And reimagining communities of solidarity and political action uh, has often been done through a municipal lens. And in recent years, there's been a growing focus on municipalism as a philosophical framework uh, for democratizing power and resources and building grassroots urban institutions, sometimes in radical ways. When we factor in the question of labor, we have to contemplate how the workplace fits into the organization of urban space and how labor organizing operates both inside and outside the workplace and in the streets. Estás tomando apuntes, Andres. Yo me perdí. Can you hear the interpreter? I can. I cannot hear the interpreter. So, uh, <laughs> I think the interpreter is muted for me. But can other people hear the? No. Okay. So, okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm I'm trying to speak. You're not able to hear me. I cannot. I couldn't hear you just now. So, but I can, can hear you, you hear now. Me? Can you I hear me hear now? You. Yeah. You can hear me now. Yes. Okay. Uh, um. Start over, or do you want me to continue? I. Uh. uh it would be great to start over because I only was able to note a small amount of what you said. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We'll start over. Uh, and I also, I forgot to introduce myself. So let us, let us start from scratch right now. Um, so I'll go back to the beginning. Okay. So um, welcome to the second installment of the Solidarity Research Center's ongoing discussion of municipal. Bienvenido a la segunda instalación del Centro de Estudios de Solidaridad. Okay, and fittingly for May 1st, today we're going to focus on labor and municipalism and the role of municipalist ideas within the labor movement today. Y apto para el día primero de mayo, vamos a hablar de, de eh, sindicalismo y labor y municipalismo. So we know that for centuries, working class communities have struggled to exercise their rights in the civic sphere, as well as control over their labor conditions, often in tandem with other social movements. And reimagining- Sabemos, oh, sorry. <laughs> sabemos que durante siglos, los obreros han luchado por ejercer sus derechos cívicos y condiciones de trabajo. And uh, reimagining communities of solidarity and political action through a municipal lens has been a core part of that in recent years. Y reimaginar eh, el sindicalismo por un, un eh, espejo municipal ha sido parte de esos estudios. So over the past few years, there's been a growing focus on municipalism as a framework for democratizing power and resources and building grassroots urban institutions, sometimes in radically reimagined ways. Y, eh, en los últimos años se ha usado municipalismo como un eh, marco intelectual para reimaginar cómo eh, democratizar el poder y hacer que las instituciones sean del pueblo. When we factor in the question of labor, we have to contemplate how the workplace fits into the organization of urban space and how labor Vamos. organizing operates both inside and outside the workplace as well as in the streets. 
Andrés, tú puedes hacer eso. Cuando se considera lo que es la labor, when you factor in labor, the interpreter needs a repeat, please. Oh, when we factor in the question of labor, we have to contemplate how the workplace fits into the organization of urban space. Cuando se toma en cuenta el factor de la labor, tienes que tomar en cuenta cómo cabe dentro del espacio de, del lugar de trabajo. And we have to think about how labor organizing operates both inside and outside the workplace as well as in the streets. Please do. Y tenemos que ver cómo funciona esto dentro y fuera del lugar de trabajo. Um, so we know that leftist and labor-led urban insurgencies are not new, and labor history is punctuated by these catalytic uprisings from the Paris Commune to the general strikes in the early part of the 20th century. Sabemos que la insurgencia urbana no es nueva, y todo se remonta incluso a lo que llamaban la Comuna de París. Eh, y otros movimientos que han existido en, en el municipalismo y la, y la labor. Although their cultural legacy may have outlived their material impact on the urban spaces where these events originated. Aunque había, había habido un legado. Uh, may I ask for repetition? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> so, um, Let's start over. Okay, so the, the cultural legacy of these events may have outlived their material impact on the urban spaces where they originated. El legado que de, de estas uh, municipalidades eh, eh, ha vivido más, ha durado más que el impacto que ha tenido en los espacios urbanos. With the workplace becoming an increasingly hierarchical and privatized space, Does... Con el, okay, go ahead. Sorry. En, el lugar, en los lugares de trabajo se ha eh, desarrollado más jerarquismo. Uh, does the municipalist framework give the labor movement tools for self-organization and cooperation for exploring new forms of self-determination? Y el municipalismo nos da herramientas para organización y cooperación para poder vencer esos obstáculos. So our speakers today are going to talk about how our understanding of labor and the labor movement changes when we start to see work, the family and community as part of a municipal collectivity. Y los presentadores que tenemos hoy van, nos van a hablar sobre cómo el entendimiento de lo que es el la fuerza laboral con sus movimientos y eh, la participación de la familia eh, va a tener ha tenido un impacto okay. and now I think we're ready to explain how the interpretation is going to work for the rest of the panel so uh, on this slide you see instructions Um, and an explanation of how uh, those elements will work. Um, and Vamos a explicar cómo funciona la interpretación en los controles de su reunión o seminario web que tienen ahí. Tiene que hacer clic en, en la parte inferior derecha. Hay un globo que dice interpretación y tiene que hacer clic en el idioma que desea escuchar. Como manera opcional para oír solo el idioma interpretado, tiene que hacer clic en silenciar el audio original. Okay. And now we'll just quickly review the agenda. Um, so first we will have Sheldon Stormquist giving historical context, and then that will be followed by Claudia Jimenez uh, discussing new developments around municipalism in Richmond. Rand Wilson will discuss his work organizing in Somerville. And unfortunately, one of our guests for uh, this event, uh, Bianca Cunningham, was not able to make it today. So uh, we are having a three-person panel. And I'll just quickly give 
uh, some introductions for each of them. Uh, Sheldon Stormquist is a historian specializing in labor and social history and a lifelong labor and civil rights activist. He is the author or editor of eight books, including Frontiers of Labor, Reinventing the People, and Labor's Cold War. He is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Iowa. His most recent book, published in February, is Claiming the City, a Global History of Workers' Fight for Municipal Socialism. Claudia Jimenez is a co-chair of the Richmond Progressive Alliance and was elected to Richmond City Council in 2020, joined by a majority of progressive municipal elected officials. As a lawmaker, Claudia has been instrumental in passing a budget that addresses key proposals to reimagine public safety in Richmond, as well as saving millions of dollars to the city by passing budget policies to get the city out of swap bond deals. She has led several campaigns in Richmond and Contra Costa County, including Invest in People Not in the, including the Invest in People Not Prison campaign, which forged an alliance of African-American and immigrant community leaders in Contra Costa to end the sheriff's cooperation with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Secure Communities Program. Rand Wilson is the convener of a community labor coalition, Somerville Stands Together. He's also been a union organizer since the 1980s and was founding director of Massachusetts Jobs for Justice. In 2016, he co-founded Labor for Bernie and has remained active in our revolution at the local, state, and national levels. Wilson is board chair of the ICA group and the fund for jobs worth owning. He's also an elected member of Ward 6 Somerville Democratic Committee and serves as a trustee for the Somerville Job Creation and Retention Trust. He has previously worked as an organizer for the Communication Workers of America and is currently a part-time organizer for Teamsters for a Democratic Union. He has also written and lectured widely about contract campaigns, strikes, healthcare reform, and strategies to build workers' political power. So we're going to kick off the conversation with Sheldon, uh, giving us some historical context for the current municipalist moment we're living in. Uh, thanks very much, Michelle. That it's great to be with you all on this Labor Day, uh, Labor Day, the Labor Day, the real Labor Day, as I like to call it, um, on May Day. Uh, it's a day of deep historical meaning for workers, as we know, around the world. And uh, like spring itself, uh, it holds the promise of renewal and growth of a social movement capable of transforming uh, the cities that we claim as our own. Um, but to begin on a somewhat more sobering note, um, we also have to recognize that we're living through a historical moment when the erasure of the past has become routine, uh, where we are led to believe that slavery was benign, um, that our established political institutions and constitution are sacrosanct and inviolable, uh, that our established political institutions um, uh, uh, do not include any consideration of something we might call socialism. Indeed, indeed, socialism is a curse word in this erasure of history of no relevance, apparently, to the American experience, or if not downright subversive and unthinkable. So as we, as we struggle to build a humane, democratic, and equitable society, I think we're at risk of doing so in a historical vacuum, of somehow believing that we are without any historical precedents or models. As we read the political landscape, it may seem more barren, uh, less hopeful, more tenuous than if we knew and understood the profoundly challenging social movements of the past, their victories, but also their limitations, uh, their conversancy with socialism, um, and, uh, and their visions of a different future uh, that inspired them. In the limited time I'm going to take with all of you, I, I want to give um, some historical glimpses um, into this past that I think is vital for us to uh, know and to learn from. Um, historians often rankle at the notion of lessons of the past. Um, times change, circumstances vary, sources of strength and weakness are never exactly the same. And yet there is much we can learn from our own history and the ways we can make it useful to the present. 
um, the ways we can adapt its lessons, if you will, to our needs. So one of the erasures, it seems to me, that I want to talk about is the vitality of social movements that rose to challenge the long history of elite rule in cities. And the emergence um, through the struggle of working people, and that is critical, um, of an alternative. And yes, let's speak its name, municipal socialism. We've lost sight of that history, or we, we have, we're at risk of losing sight. Uh, we've forgotten that in the early 20th century, socialists governed literally hundreds of cities in the US and thousands worldwide. We've not adequately reckoned with the achievements, um, with what they achieved to make cities livable and democratic, to build a robust public sector of municipal services, to win respect and dignity for public workers, the institute fairer taxes that shift the burden to the wealthy. We are, it seems to me, the beneficiaries of um, this legacy that these activists created. And we unfortunately may take it for granted, unaware that it was through popular struggle um, that, uh, that was driven by a socialist vision that this movement took shape. But as we know, this historical legacy remains highly contested. Uh, as neoliberals push to alter the fabric of our cities, to privatize city services, to reduce taxes on the rich, to cripple public sector unions, to deny cities the right to home rule and the ability to govern themselves, and in some ways most fundamentally to disfranchise the people we uh, identify with most, and that is working class voters and the poor. So let me just for a few minutes dive into the weeds um, of this history. I wanna make four points. Um, the first is, I think we need to recognize how widespread socialism was and is. In my new book, uh, Claiming the City, I document hundreds of cases of socialist municipal governance around the world from Bradford, England to Butte, Montana, from Frankfurt, Germany to Broken Hill, New South Wales, from Vienna, Austria to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. These socialists won power through struggle in the streets, in city council chambers, on picket lines, and at the ballot box. In the US, at least 180 cities elected social governments uh, socialist governments just between 1911 and 1920. Ohio cities alone elected 29 socialist administrations during those same years. Milwaukee may be the best remembered, but other cities included Schenectady and Reading, Pennsylvania, Flint, Minneapolis, Davenport, Newcastle, Indiana, Columbus, Ohio, and Bridgeport, Connecticut, among others. Many socialist governments were short-lived. They succumbed to fusion by opposing parties, where those parties joined forces to defeat the socialists and then separated into their real identities. Or these governments were undermined by state preemption, something we face in spades today. Or especially in the US, the socialists were attacked and repressed for their opposition to World War I and conscription. But some survived and flourished, uh, as in the cases of Red Vienna, for instance, or Broken Hill, New South Wales, or Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and there were others around the world. The second point I wanna make is that I wanna reinforce the, the argument that this municipal movement came about at a particular moment under specific historical circumstances in which the labor movement and the role of the labor movement was absolutely vital. In the late 19th century, precarious and intolerable working conditions at the workplace, in mines, on the railroads and the docks, in manufacturing and construction sites, 
These conditions precipitated a worldwide wave of mass strikes involving tens of thousands of workers who challenged the dominance of their employers and the repressive power of the state. This was in many ways a new working class, analogous, I think, in some respects to the new working class of today. Many were previously unrepresented by trades unions. Through their collective efforts and direct action, they created new robust unions that broke the mold of previous organizations. This great upheaval, as we refer to it in the United States, had its counterpart around the world, on the London docks, among sheep shearers in the Australian outback, and dock workers on the wharves of Sydney, among textile workers in Bradford and Mas Manchester, England, among railroad workers in Chicago and points west, among coal miners in Germany and elsewhere. In these labor struggles, a new local politics was born that challenged for power, first and foremost, in cities. The third point I want to make is that small victories can be cumulative and produce big results. There is a sense of isolation when only a few socialists are elected to local councils or when the percentage of the popular vote seems inadequate for the transformative changes that we aspire to. But municipal socialists discovered the value of what you might call trench warfare in local government bodies. They astutely used the bully pulpit and procedural challenges. They cobbled together temporary coalitions and built over time a base of support. Whether in Hamilton, Ohio, Vienna, Austria, Bradford, England, or Milwaukee, their tactics were fundamentally the same. Edward Hartley, a butcher, and Fred Jowett, a textile worker, were part of a small socialist minority in Bradford City Council in England. They were socialists, but they were also pragmatists. As Jowett put it in 1907, as socialists, we might still aspire to establish a socialist city where there will be bread for all, work for all, and no fireless grates. But the toll taken on the stunted victims themselves necessitated a more practical, if circuitous, path forward. The socialist must needs work his passage to the socialist city by means of municipal trading, housing reform, municipal milk supply, and education. Russell Smart was another leading British municipal socialist who made a similar point in 1895. Quote, he realized that the path from competitive anarchy to orderly collectivism was gradual. And he depicted nothing heroic, nothing to captivate the senses and charm the imagination. Victory, he said, would come not in a single showdown, but the struggle held out promise to those whose mental vision can pierce the darkness of the present. I love that phrasing. He concluded, the future looks bright with hope, for we see shining in the distance the lights of our new Jerusalem, the city whose wealth consists not in the fortunes of its millionaires, but in the health and happiness of the men and women who inhabit it. These municipal socialists also discovered that changes could come suddenly by being in a position to seize the moment. A new wave of mass strikes between 1909 and 1914, and this is globally, worldwide, and popular mobilization led to more municipal victories. The examples are legion. Socialist Hugo Lindemann came within a hair's breadth of winning the mayoralty in Stuttgart, Germany in 1911. In Hamilton, Ohio, the socialist vote jumped from 5% to 29% in two years, between 1908 and 1910. An organizer reported that the, quote, socialist headquarters 
went from being a lamppost on High Street to a comfortable hall downtown. Some of that success came from building counter institutions. They stressed the day-to-day -day work of party organization. They built cooperatives and understood the value of cultural activity. In the cities of West Yorkshire, cycling clubs, labor choirs, labor churches, street speaking and May Day celebrations fed a contagious spirit of socialist revivalism. They created alternative media. Today it is social media, but then it was a vibrant labor press. Electoral politics served as training ground for activists. What I like to call translocal solidarity networks, exactly what you are doing with events like those today, broke down the isolation of local work. Internationalism spread the news of what works in other municipalities. And here I think of the model of participatory budgeting that developed in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and has spread worldwide as a strategy for building local power. Finally, I want to stress that we are heirs to what we might call everyday municipal socialism, the legacy of past struggles that also provide a roadmap for meeting the challenges of the present. We must expand the public sector and recognize and build on what we have inherited. The examples are all around us, public water and sewerage, street repair and maintenance, garbage collection, public transit, schools, social welfare, libraries, public space, parks, auditoriums, public housing, public health services, and public, like not private police, who we must hold accountable like other public employees. So we have to recognize there are areas for growth, especially related to climate change in cities. And we have to create public electricity and natural gas, solar and other alternative energies, not in private hands, but in public hands. We have to build local communications networks, um, control cable TV and radio and internet in ways that make it accessible to all. We have to create public markets and build cooperatives. And above all, we must defend municipal and public sector workers. In the Midwest, in Wisconsin, and my own state of Iowa, we know this all too well, as state government has attacked the right to collective bargaining of public sector workers with a viciousness we've not seen before. We also have to defend public schools and their teachers who are under siege these days. We must fight for municipal taxes that are progressive, not, tax, not taxes on sales or consumption. The model of Red Vienna, and that was some, that's something I would love to talk more about, but um, it's something we should bear in mind. And one of the keys there to the socialists taking power in 1919 at the end of World War I was gaining control of the sources of public revenue. Uh, the rest of the world watched Red Vienna as it took shape and unfolded. The Australian Worker, a newspaper in Australia, wrote in 1925, the socialist most hated in Vienna by the well-to-do is Hugo Breitner. Speak to them of Lenin, Trotsky, or Liebknecht, and they will listen with perfect calm. But you mention the name Breitner, and the calm is replaced by fury and hate. He is credited with the intention of destroying the whole economic life of Vienna. In reality, he's merely the author of the financial policy of the Municipal Council. Breitner's new tax scheme introduced new, some 18 new taxes, which chiefly hit those who can afford to pay. And for this, he was bitterly hated. So are there lessons, if, if I may say, that we should be especially attentive to? And I think there are. Very briefly, we should define and share our municipal agendas that are coherent and comprehensive in the way that those in the past have done. One of the striking things is how widely these municipal programs were shared from one city to another. They enable us in their comprehensiveness to envision the new cities we hope to create. We need to build party loyalty 
and accountability to those elected with our support. In Hamilton, Ohio, socialist counselors were required to appear at party meetings and take direction from those who had elected them. We have to enter state legislative campaigns um, in order to win and protect home rule and to block state preemption of local initiatives. We have to stop state curtailment of voting rights. This part of a long struggle for municipal voting rights that have always been somewhat separate from uh, parliamentary or legislative uh, uh, voting rights. We have to challenge racism and sexism in every form, every day, by building multiracial and multi-ethnic movements. We must make translocal and international connections and solidarity stronger uh, as we seek to build and reinforce a worldwide movement today as they had in the past. But lastly, we must take seriously the cautionary lessons of the Paris Commune and Red Vienna. Municipal power ultimately is not enough. We must ensure workers' claims to municipal power by building power at the state level, especially in the US, where Republicans have taken control over so, so many state legislatures, and also nationally. But, and this is so important, we must start at the bottom by politically securing the cities as self-governing enclaves that embody our highest aspirations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shell. And now we will move on to Claudia, and uh, we're going to talk about the Richmond Progressive Alliance. Thank you, everybody, and for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, Claudia Jimenez, um, I am one of the co chair of the Richmond Progressive Alliance, and happy to be here and talk about our experience in, in, in Richmond. Um, I became co-chair uh, a few years ago, but the Richmond Progressive Alliance has been a political organization in Richmond for almost 20 years. And it started uh, when a group of residents in Richmond uh, decided that enough was enough uh, and that we needed a uh, representation of people rooted in our community, progressive people who can advance a progressive agenda at the local level. Uh, that may means um, to support us uh, better services, uh, to support taxing corporations and making sure that uh, big corporation like Chevron, which is one of the largest refinery and is in Richmond backyard, uh, pays the, the fair share. Um, so in um, almost 20 years ago, um, a group of residents started to uh, think about what it would like to have um, an organization that was able to support leaders, residents in the community that um, to be able to run that. Otherwise, they won't have uh, enough support or enough infrastructure enough funding to to run a campaign and to be able actually to win. So uh, it was, um, we started like one by one. So in the beginning, uh, we ran uh, council member McLaughlin, uh, Gail McLaughlin and um, Andres Soto. Um, and Gail won. Uh, Andres didn't, and Gail was the only progressive in this uh, city council uh, that uh, was uh, full of people support, supported by Chevron. And um, it, it was all well known that Chevron always had like majority in the city, uh, majority of city council in the city. Um, so one of the main things that um, the organization is started to, um, to advocate is that uh, we can run candidates who can pledge to not take corporate uh, money or police association money uh, for their campaigns. 
And that was like key, as I said before, because um, we are we are a corporate town, and um, it used to be that Richmond was managed by Chevron. One of the uh, things that people were talking about was that Chevron used to have a, a desk at the city manager office in Richmond. And over the years, uh, we have been able to uh, win more power and be able to uh, get more progressive into the city council at that point where today we have a majority progressive elected officials in the city, including me in one of these seats. Uh, I run in 2020 uh, with um, an slate of progressive with Melvin Williams and Gail McLaughlin, and we all won. Um, and um, what uh, is is important in in terms of the this conversation and uh, uh, around mun municipalism is that um, even though sometimes uh, there is you you feel like in local local politics it's, it doesn't have a lot of impact. Uh, in the kind of like broader uh, scope of um, a federal or a state um, politics, it, it does. Um, remember, um, the cities uh, we have the able to change budgets and to approve budgets to make sure that we have progressive tax taxations, like uh, my other the presenter was talking about, um, we, ha, um, we are able to, um, in, in, for instance, in, in Richmond to start thinking about what just transition looks like for Richmond in terms of um, when Chevron's a close or, and, and, and we are able to pass from a fossil fuel economy to a more green economy, to a more, um, um green um in infrastructure uh and an economy that doesn't depend on um really um getting away with taxes uh polluting or 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 or, or land and or air and no supporting um workers but an economy that really could um uh, workers and uh, people most impacted um, at first. Um, so RPA has evolved, evolved into something like a local political party uh, with a clearly pro-labor orientation and solutions. Um, most of our RPA members are registered as Democrats um, who understands that at least the lo at the local level, um, we we can do some changes and it's it, it's it's really key that like what RPA is important in and in, uh, particularly in an state that votes Democrat the majority is because um, we uh, are starting we are starting to be uh, the the sides um, who is not the corporate Democrat we like. For instance, here, um, every, every candidate who runs is, uh, is a Democrat. So there is no a lot of a difference for the local resident uh, who wants to vote um, uh, differently or more progressive. If RPA wasn't here, there were no that much difference because everybody is a, demo, uh, is, is a Democrat. Um, so we have been able to uh, uh, um, just di divide these uh, and and divide and also just stand out uh, with the progressive candidates and really uh, show the difference that we have that we are not the, no, the normal demo, uh, corporate Democrat that is receiving money from the corporation that is against uh, uh, progressive taxations. For instance, like I, I can tell you an example in 2020, um, 
RPA in, in collaboration uh, with the progressive unions here um, and uh, com community organizations endorsed um, and um, um, or candidates were able to put, uh, the progressive city council at that time were able to put on the, uh, on the ballot a measure that is called Measure U to change like the, the business license tax, which it was a flat and a regressive taxation into a more progressive taxation. And the ballot initiative was called Measure U. And uh, the, the, the Democratic Party didn't endorse that. And it was all of a combination of labor, uh, community organization, and Richmond Progressive Alliance who were able to move that. And we were able to win um, with 70% of the votes. And that also, we were able to win all the three candidates that we were, um, we were uh, moving, uh, or we were endorsing. Um, so um, that has been really important uh, for us here uh, to show and educate uh, our, our community around uh, the difference between uh, different candidates. Um, and that has been important. Another one was uh, the rain control. Uh, we were able to pass a rain control after 10 years of none of the cities in California being able to pass rain control. And so Richmond was, uh, uh, and I've, Richmond approved that. And it was also an example of this collaboration among labor community organizations and Richmond Progressive Alliance. And with that also moving good candidates um, and progressive candidates to be able to take uh, the power in the city council. Um, we are an organization that a difference from uh, other political organizations, we don't show up just uh, every election. Uh, we work uh, year round uh, with, uh, with other um, community organization around different issues uh, in the community. So we are a constant presence in our community and it's because um, we, our, our membership, which is a volunteer organization, um, lives in Richmond, cared about Richmond and had been engaged around uh, Richmond politics because they have seen how uh, we are winning, how the, the meaningful changes that we had had around making Chevron uh, more accountable and pay more taxes um, around uh, public safety and making sure that uh, we are moving or, or, or budget in a direction to, um, in, to provide more support and no criminalizing people. And instead of that, really making sure that we are um, funding um, real solutions that uh, go uh, just really tackle the root causes of uh, violence in, in the city. Um, so we have been able to, um, to be, to move Richmond in a different direction and and in, in, in terms of that, I, I see our impact um, can not only be at the local level, but it can be at the state level and at the national level. And especially when we talk about um, big corporation like Chevron um, and the, the whole oh, work around just transition. So when I... Um, one time I was talking to my husband and, and I was like, well, I am from Colombia. I would like to do kind of like more international work. I see how, um, and I don't like, I, I was struggling with like the world, my world be so uh, focused on the local level. And he, his answer was, well, did you really want to do something international? Like, um, and, and he's, at our own environment, um, you and your backyard had Chevron and is one of the largest uh, refinery in the United States. And you know that US is the lar largest polluter 
in, in the world. And um, one of the largest polluters in US is a company like refineries and one of the refineries is here. So a lot of the impact that we can do locally uh, can be show um, a, at the state, at the national and international level. So um, it's really key. Like I, I always see uh, Richmond as a key place uh, for us to, to be working on uh, issues around in, in environment around taxation uh, because um, we uh, the where we are located and where the companies that we have here like Chevron is um, uh, so I, I think like what I wanted to say is also that um, as as I said before um, RPA is an organization that is not just uh, it shows every two years in the um, in the elections, but we are all year round trying to work with communities around many, many different issues. But it's also, um, we create uh, an infrastructure um, that allows residents who have been working really hard to put us in power to make us accountable. And it create a contab an, an accountability infrastructure that, uh, if we are not um, pushing for the right things that our community is asking us, um, we don't get the support in next elections, right? Um, and that is, is important. And um, I think like uh, we need that accountability in every level because um, our experiences is that even progressive folks who get elected in, in, at, in other levels, um, then it's hard uh, to get them accountable to really to the local community to be grounded in the local issues um, because there is no that infrastructure that provides that uh, um, a space for residents to really make sure that um, they are doing what um, or, or community elected us to do. Um, so. RPA at the local level has been able to do that. Um, we, and, and also in, in terms of the uh, um, support, we, um, this organi our organization RPA is an organization that understand that uh, it's not enough to uh, work really hard to get somebody elected. But as we elect somebody, uh, there is a lot of support that is needed. And especially in local um, towns like Richmond and other uh, municipalities like us where um, each city council uh, gets paid $16,000 per year without any, uh, any staff. Um, so uh, it really is this uh, city manager form of governments that we have are is, is spaces for um, privileged folks, for people who are rich or people who are retired. Uh, but we are asking um, women of color, uh, single moms, uh, people, um, uh, black uh, uh, residents, uh, teachers and low-income folks to uh, be able to put their hats into this and then um, and then putting them in this situation where um, if they don't have the support, they are not able to, to succeed because it's a lot of work. So what Richmond Progressive Alliance has been able to do is to create with the volunteers spaces where we can support um, the governing of these elected officials who want to do things, but sometimes it's like limited resources that they have. Um, so one example of that is that um, we, we have a um, city action team and it's volunteers that meet every Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon to go over the agenda, uh, the city council agenda and highlight uh, things to discuss and uh, get 
people to volunteer to do some research, additional research necessary to uh, for the city council to be more informed. Uh, every Tuesday that we go to uh, the city uh, the city council meeting to really be able to approve um, items with more information. Um, because I do remember like every Tuesday, like we in Richmond, we meet um, the first, second and fourth Tuesday of each month. And to say yes, no, or abstain in many important issues in, in Richmond. And sometimes to pass uh, and approve millions and millions of dollars that are going to really direct impact of residents is we don't move or we move things that are and in, in not in the right in the right situation. So um, uh, this is something that uh, we do for our community, but at the same time, um, we have some um, shortcomings. Um, we, as a volunteer organization, like we don't have resources to say, well, let's do some research about this innovative policy so we can support um, the passing of these policies. And, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that we need to strengthen. And we, we have been able to do some of that through the collaboration among labor, among co community organization, but it's, it's not enough. And so we understand that. It's not enough also that we are a volunteer organization needs more young folks to be part of this organization. We are trying more and more to get more people of color, more young folks uh, to be part uh, of this movement and this um, uh, and and this organization. And, and this is something that we are working really hard. Um, and, and we continue to engage every year more and more. But it, it, it's again, as a volunteer organization, we have some of the, a, a, fragile infrastructure that uh, one day they are there, but one day they cannot, um, but we continue. And um, so, uh, and, and we, we every year, I, I feel like every election we had been able to prove that uh, we had been able to have, to gain more power um, because um, all the, the alliance that we had been able to, to have um, the, the support that we have been able to get and the recognition in the community of what we have been doing. Um, so I will stop here um, and let other folks to talk and happy to answer questions. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Rand Wilson talking about his work with Somerville Stands Together. Oh, and um, for those of you with questions, uh, this is just a quick reminder, please use the Q&A function to type in your question, and we'll be reading those um, uh, to the panelists and answering them at the end of the speaker. Are we, do we have a hard stop at five o'clock Eastern, or can I go just a little to, you know, I don't want to take up all the time for the Q&A, but we're I'm just concerned about the time. Could somebody give me just like an eight minute warning? Would that be fair? Thumbs up there from the chair. Okay, and can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah. okay. Hey, um, this is tough act to follow. Professor uh, Stromquist and Claudia just did a great job. Um, I am going to very quickly run through uh, a little bit about Somerville Stands Together. I want to preface my remarks by saying that it is not a socialist organization, and unlike the RPA, it is a coalition uh, group, and we'll go into that in more detail. Um, let's see if I can make the slides work. There we go. Um, Somerville is uh, a city of about 88, no, 82,000 people uh, nestled uh, just north of Cambridge in the Boston metropolitan area. Um, if you've lived here for a while, you, you'll know that we call ourselves villains uh, very proudly. Um, it's a city where uh, uh, we had a, 
uh, for a long time, uh, like an entrenched uh, mayor for 18 years who was uh, very anti-labor and um, who oversaw the redevelopment of the city and the introduction of a new sublate line that's made for major changes in the city, huge displacement of residents. Um, and, uh, uh, but thanks to Bernie Sanders, uh, we had a, uh, our level, uh, a local Our Revolution chapter that elected a, uh, a majority uh, on the city council in 2017. And with that new majority uh, on the city council, labor was very eager to ally with uh, 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 our revolution and community groups. And that's what gave rise to our local coalition. Um, <clears throat> since 2018, our group has grown. I hope this shows up on the screen, uh, about uh, 25 or six different uh, labor and uh, civic uh, and now environmental organizations in the community. And our process is really simple. We meet once a month for exactly an hour um, and all the coalition work gets done by activists in subcommittees uh, where they volunteer. Um, all of our decisions are generally made by consensus, although we have had a couple of votes where we require a super uh, majority to make a, an endorsement or something like that. Uh, we have no funding, no budget, and no staff. Um, our initial demands uh, were really just around affordable housing, uh, fair contracts for municipal workers, uh, and uh, for union labor on local construction projects. Um, now I'm gonna run through a very quick overview of our campaigns. This was one of our big kickoffs when a local developer wanted to uh, build affordable housing, but not uh, pay the prevailing wage, which was required because of the uh, state and federal funding going into the project. And so we really rallied uh, both in the streets like here and then uh, at a city council meeting to oppose a waiver and um, uh, lost that vote uh, at the city council, but we did prevail uh, at the state house and uh, force the developer to come up with a business model to, to uh, uh, pay the prevailing wage. Uh, we've been active on uh, getting uh, two major nonprofits in Somerville, uh, Tufts University and Mass General Brigham to uh, pay their fair share uh, and uh, for uh, uh, contribute to the community. Um, <clears throat> there's a like $2 billion development in going on in the heart of the city in Union Square. And we've been tried to get a, a project labor agreement there unsuccessfully, even after this enormous rally, but it was uh, successful at, at pushing uh, the developer US2 to agree to a community benefits agreement, which has some local hire provisions that are pretty important. Uh, we don't shy away from local politics. Uh, this was an uh, advertisement for a municipal forum that, that we sponsored. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we were forced to start meeting by Zoom, but we did do uh, a major food drive. Look on the right there, you'll see that uh, thanks to the labor movement, we had a phenomenal donation of uh, groceries uh, on just one Saturday. Um, we've been, bat as I mentioned earlier, we've been battling Tufts for, uh, for pilot payments, but also uh, supporting the custodians, the dining hall workers, and the adjunct professors there, um, showing up on picket lines like our local grocery store uh, stop and shop strike. And uh, uh, we helped to kick off a Somerville Workers Center, which is uh, been focused on fighting and wage theft and educating immigrant workers about their rights. Um, we fought for the Somerville Public School Paris to get a, uh, a living wage. Uh, uh, that's jamming the city council or the school committee meeting, I should say. Um, and then over the last couple of years, uh, environmentalists uh, have been kind of uh, uh, 
uh, invading our group. I wouldn't say that's the right word, but um, um, kind of coming into the coalition and wanting to work with labor and community groups. And so we've adopted a, a campaign for a municipal Green New Deal, which we kicked off in 2020 with uh, uh, a labor climate uh, summit meeting. And uh, we've been developing a very strong critique of the uh, city's uh, climate forward plan. We call it, we need to go climate further forward. Um, Royal Hospitality is a large uh, laundry in the city with the union membership and um, going to be displaced because of that $2 billion project in uh, Union Square. So we've been campaigning to keep the jobs here or at least have a just transition for those workers. And uh, just a real recent victory is uh, uh, led by the Painters Union and Union United in Union Square. Uh, using that community benefits agreement that we campaigned for, uh, getting uh, a non-union painter thrown off the job and uh, an agreement for a, a unionized painter that will use local Somerville residents on a construction project. This was done after about two months of these guys standing out in the cold uh, campaigning for Somerville residents to get jobs. Um, recently, we've been on, uh, standing up on uh, supporting the Starbucks workers at a coffee shop down the street from my house, just went on strike and we held a sip in in the coffee, uh, in the coffee shop. And over time, our coalition goals have really evolved uh, to embrace a bunch of new issues, a municipal Green New Deal that I mentioned and a municipal employee apprentice training, ship, uh, training program. Uh, municipal broadband for all, uh, winning more community benefits agreements, racial justice and organizing rights. Uh, as part of the labor spring that just uh, occurred in the month of uh, March and April, we held a teach-in on unions and racial and economic justice that was uh, very well attended and set an agenda for uh, Somerville Stands Together to coalesce with uh, people of color in our community for uh, uh, to address issues of racism and jobs in the community. Um, key takeaways are that um, our local community uh, and <clears throat> environmental and, uh, organ and uh, civic organizations are really eager to work together on uh, shared goals. Um, people are really thrilled to have labor uh, at the table. Um, uh, Local jobs, affordable housing, pilot, climate change, worker organizing are issues that have united our coalition members in Somerville. Whoops. Whoa, I got, got messed up there. Okay. And um, uh, developing a vision for a municipal Green New Deal has really been a, uh, uh, a unifying um, uh, objective. Uh, we have fun. We also march in the um, annual honk parade. Uh, and we uh, celebrate our victories at uh, holiday parties and uh, get togethers, uh, especially now that the pandemic is over. And I just want to wish everybody a happy May Day and give a big shout out to all of the Somerville residents uh, that are on this munis uh, municipalism uh, call. So I'll stop there and um, let's see, stop the share uh, and wish everybody happy. Happy International Workers' Day. Thank you very much. And now it uh, looks like we had a last minute influx of questions for the Q&A, but I think we have about 11 minutes. Um, maybe some people want to stay a little later, but um, uh, yeah, so we're going to try to squeeze these in. I guess the best way to do this might be to ask the questions in batches and then uh, see uh, who among the panelists wants to pick them up maybe just like one, one person per question. So uh, going in, I think, uh, the order in which they were received. Um, okay, so we have um, a question on participatory budgeting from Jim Labe at Participatory Budgeting Oregon. Um, wants to know, uh, well, they're strategizing on how we advance participatory budgeting that supports public sector workers and uh, enlists them in shaping and backing proposals. Uh, so uh, um, yes, Jim wants to hear um, about folks who have thought or organized on this question. Um, Cliff Smith 
of Roofers Local 36 Los Angeles asks, what steps can be taken toward building a workers party? And Internet Chavez uh, asks about union reform. A lot of money is collected from hardworking uh, individuals every pay period in the form of union dues. However, not all individual workers are represented equally. So that's one question about union reform. And, um, and Matthew Slats asks um, if there are any thoughts or efforts around a job guarantee in connection to municipalism and labor. Okay, so uh, rounding those up. So we have participatory budgeting, uh, building a workers party, union reform, and job guarantee. So we'll just, anyone who wants to take any one of those, feel free to jump in. Okay, Rand. Well, I, I, I think I could just mention on union reform, uh, there are so many exciting developments uh, at the, uh, national and local level. Um, and just a big shout out to uh, the, the transformation in the auto workers union leadership that just occurred as a result of one member, one vote. New leadership in the Teamsters Union, thanks to Teamsters for a Democratic Union, and uh, a, a emerging uh, reform movement in the United Food and Commercial Workers Union uh, to uh, uh, win one member, one vote in that union and uh, clean up um, the uh, long history of kind of substandard uh, contracts there. Um, so a lot of optimism about the union reform movement in this moment, um, thanks to uh, vigorous efforts by members. Um, and if we want to have more of that, uh, we need to have more uh, democracy in our unions and fighting for that democracy is the best way forward. Um, Brother Smith asks about the question of a workers party. And I would just say, um, you know, at the municipal level, uh, at least in the community that I am in and in most communities here in Massachusetts, um, it's really not an issue uh, that there's only, it's a nonpartisan um, uh, environment. We, uh, there is no democratic or Republican candidates in Somerville. There are, there are only candidates for office, and that's both a, a blessing and a curse. But uh, um, uh, I, I personally, uh, inspired by Bernie Sanders, have been looking to build uh, that workers' party uh, within the Democratic uh, uh, Party rather than outside of it. Um, and I think uh, we heard something similar from Claudia. And so uh, on the job guarantees, um, I would just say that one of the most important issues that links labor unions and community is the question of local hire and the opportunity to uh, make a demand that employers, uh, you know, be transparent about the number of local people that are getting jobs. This is an environmental demand. It's a union demand and it's a community demand. And um, we need to uh, crack open the workplace secrecy and force employers to be transparent about how many local residents they're hiring and make them hire uh, uh, an acceptable number that the community determines as um, uh, appropriate and provide us uh, uh, training and a pathway for our high school residents, uh, high school graduates and other residents uh, to get local jobs. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, unless Claudia, do you want to you want to go? I I would like to say just a word about um, participatory budgeting and also um, about the Workers Party idea. Um, you know, I I think I think we need multiple paths to power uh, in the municipality, and um, some of those are through the existing um, institutions. That is, doing precisely what Claudia and her colleagues are doing in Richmond of electing uh, reliable and good people to local council and then holding them accountable. Um, but I think it's also important that the kind of participatory budgeting model that developed in Porto Alegre and now as Jim has suggested is, you know, uh, is appearing all kinds of places in this country and, and around the world. And, and that's creating alternative paths, in a sense, and accessibility 
outside of the existing political structures to a share of power in cities and a share of governance. And I think in terms of accessibility, the evidence suggests that participatory budgeting really draws new people in who don't necessarily participate in traditional electoral politics. Um, and that those new ways of exercising power and, and, and an influence on governance, I think are hugely important in terms of building the base of a municipal movement. Um, so, so I think, uh, I mean, I would love to hear Jim talk more about what's happening in Oregon, but, but uh, these models I think are really important in terms of opening up the political process and empowering workers um, in through alternative paths. Um, uh, in terms of a workers' party, uh, you know, <laughs> historically, um, elites always claimed that oh, th this is all nonpartisan. You know, we don't we don't have parties here. We we uh, we just are all in this for the general good. Well, of course, they were in it for their own good, and mm -hmm. um, and while they weren't officially a party, they were a class. And as a class, we're exercising political power in a way that a party might. And so workers seeking to challenge that power, power um, organized through a variety of, of alternative pathway, power pathways, again. Um, and some of that um, was as a party. Um, and it might be a socialist party. It might be a public ownership party. It might be uh, any number of models. But... Um, but this, in in some ways, and again, I, I go back to what Claudia was talking about, um, the notion of instilling some discipline and some accountability uh, in this political process to the people who are elected to political office, I think makes the existence of party and partisanship on a class basis really essential. And, um, you know, unless we can do that, uh, we're going to be electing a bunch of liberals who profess to share our goals and who once in an office start, you know, making compromises all around and not fulfilling uh, our aspirations uh, as we hope they would. Right on. <laughs> Beware of liberals. Claudia, you want to wrap up? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, I agree that um, there is a, a need for many, many more organizing in this. Um, we, as, uh, as the, uh, in the RPA, have been having an, a structure that provides a representation on the steering committee for social justice organization, local unions. And even we are not a labor party in a sense, um, in, in the sense, and um, we try to represent some of that at the labor movement here. But I, uh, we, uh, as I said, like we need to strengthen, and the way that we strengthen is for uh, uh, similar organizations and a labor party, a really a strong labor party who want who help us, who help uh, solidify. Uh, a, a progressive base is important and give uh, and to provide institutional stability, political grounding, and mass support. And I think like that is important. And then the, the, the last thing that I will say also is in Richmond, we have been uh, passing policies around community benefits agreement to guarantee that there is a uh, PLAs, uh, local hiring, um, and um, support. Uh, the unions saying that is not enough. And I had been asking this question to the labor gurus and they haven't been able to answer that question. And is in a progressive uh, city council that really support labor, what are the policies that, or, that we can pass to make sure that new or, or the uh, business, the corporation that we have really is like support unions and support the creation of unions um, or, or make it easier that like we have hello fresh workers trying to organize, we were supporting them and at the end they lost the vote, right? So, um, but they, they, I haven't received any question, any answer about my question. We are ready here to support labor. We want to make it easier 
what we can do at the city level to make sure that uh, uh, these big corporations, these big uh, businesses make it easier for um, union organizing in the city. Uh, so far, I haven't received that uh, much, but I, I hope that this is something that we can really um, move forward uh, in the progressive uh, majority councils in around the country. Great. Thank you so much for this excellent discussion. Um, and I hope that it is, uh, we have many more such discussions in the future on municipalism and on the labor movement in particular. Um, thank you again to our guests, our panelists rather, uh, Rand Wilson, uh, Claudia Jimenez, Shelton Stormquist, uh, you all in the audience will be receiving a link to a survey where you can give us some feedback on uh, what you thought about this panel, uh, and you can also sign up for the uh, mailing list for uh, municipalism at municipalism.org. That is also where you can find a recording of this panel. Um, and uh, please, uh, we didn't get around to all of your questions, but uh, please feel free to get in touch with the Solidarity Research Center, um, also through that website if you have further questions or you want to explore more of these issues. Um, thank you uh, to the Solidarity Research Center again for coordinating everything. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Michelle Chen. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University's uh, School of Industrial and Labor Relations, and I do a podcast called Belabored. And uh, thank you to Yvonne uh, for coordinating everything and also to our excellent interpreters for making this whole uh, discussion possible. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Great job, everyone.